In 2021, 15 people were locked in a deep cave in France for 40 days. They spent almost a month and a half in pitch darkness and maddening silence of the deep underground. Terrifying, right? Why couldn't they be found all that time? Because no one was looking for them in the first place. They were simply being observed. It was an experiment. And it revealed a lot. For example, the participants' perception of time changed. Some thought that only 30 days had passed. Well, they must have had such a great time that it just flew by. People fairly quickly adapted to extreme and unfamiliar conditions. And we must also take into account that this experiment was temporary. It is unlikely that anyone would want to spend their entire life underground in complete confinement without sunlight and fresh air. However, that is exactly how many living creatures live. If you take all the animals on the surface of the earth, elephants, birds, fish, mice, mosquitoes, every single one, and then weigh them, it turns out that they all weigh less than all the living creatures that live underground. 20 times less. There is a whole world hidden under our feet. It doesn't know what light is. It breathes almost no oxygen and is generally unclear how it survives. Here the laws of life have been completely rewritten. And today we'll dive into this amazing universe right under our feet to find out. Why do creatures that want to live long need to live slowly? Is there good weather inside a rock? Where are the terrible creatures that can process even uranium? And how can death become a survival tool? You will learn all of this and much more in today's video. Life within the Earth. Here we are in the top layer, up to four meters, 13 feet deep. This is the surface soil layer. Life forms here mostly feel just fine. This environment isn't too different from the surface, soft, airy, and filled with moisture. It's a calm oasis amidst the chaos of Earth's deeper layers. Who can we find here? Well, first of all, earthworms. These tiny eyeless creatures are destined to live in eternal darkness. Their sole guides are skin receptors that detect faint vibrations and traces of light. They need to burrow through the soil, creating an endless network of narrow tunnels. Their movements break down organic material, enriching the soil and turning it into a fertile substrate for plant life. Frogs and toads also reside in the upper layers. They dig shelters to retain moisture, hide from predators and survive the winter. But there are even more complex creatures living here permanently. For example, moles. These underground dwellers dig long tunnels while hunting insects and worms. Moles are perfectly adapted to living underground. They use their front paws like miniature shovels to clear away soil and make space. Their speed and productivity are actually quite impressive. On average, a mole can dig 10 to 20 meters of tunnels in soft soil per day. The total length of a single mole's tunnel system can reach 200 to 300 meters. Yep, that's how much just one mole digs. Some species of moles have surprisingly large territories. For instance, the male eastern mole in North America holds the record among its kin, inhabiting an area of over one hectare. But when it comes to tunnel digging prowess, naked mole rats take the crown. Despite their name, they are neither rats or moles, but they give moles a decent run for their money. A colony of Zambian mole rats, consisting of nine to 10 individuals, can dig tunnels stretching up to 2.8 kilometers. These creatures are true digging machines. By creating their mazes, moles loosen the soil and enrich it with oxygen, which benefits plants. Of course, let's not forget that these little critters can easily ruin your favorite lawn simply by going about their daily lives. And sometimes unknowingly, they help archeologists. In their soil piles, one can occasionally find ancient artifacts, items that have been hidden underground for centuries. But no matter how comfortable rodents feel underground, their numbers pale in comparison to insects, particularly ants. Yes, it's hard to imagine, but vast ant empires thrive right beneath our feet. Ants dig extensive networks of tunnels and chambers, storing food and living in enormous colonies. No other species comes even close the largest known ant colony spans over 6,000 kilometers across Europe, stretching from northern Italy through France and into Spain. This super colony was created by Argentine ants. 
Incidentally, we have an entire video on ants about how these tiny creatures live almost like an intelligent civilization. Their survival strategies are truly fascinating. The upper layers also teem with beetles, notably dung beetles. These industrious insects drag organic waste into their burrows, helping to decompose it and turn it into rich plant substrates. Some spiders lurk in the shadows of the upper soil layer like some kind of stealthy assassins. Their webs are deadly traps for anyone bold enough to venture close. They patiently wait for their prey in the darkness. We can also find centipedes here, serving as underground sanitation workers. They consume plant remnants and dead organisms, helping to decompose organic material and contributing to the nutrient cycle. As for plants and fungi, their presence hardly needs a special mention. The upper soil layers are intertwined with roots of trees, shrubs and grasses tenaciously clinging to life. Roots provide nourishment to plants, stabilize the oil to prevent erosion, and create micro-ecosystems where fungi and bacteria live. These microorganisms happily collaborate with the roots by exchanging essential nutrients. This is truly a symbiotic relationship. Fungi exist in various forms here, including spores, colonies, and mycelium. There are countless fungi species here. They help plants absorb nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen from the soil and, in return, receive carbohydrates from the plants. Fungi also contribute to soil stability and enhance its structure. In this layer, life forms thrive, collaborate and create harmony. Unlike the deeper layers, we leave the upper soil behind to descend into a realm where chaos begins, a harsh and unpredictable world of the depths. With every foot we descend, air gives way to dense cold earth and life begins to fade. This is the transition zone, where even breathing seems like an immense challenge. You've likely felt how cold even icy spring water can be, and it comes from such depths. So here we are, 5 meters, 16 feet below the surface. What can we find at such a depth? Surprisingly, we see fox dens here. These exceptional predators occasionally dig their homes as deep as 16 feet underground. For the next few dozen feet, the temperature stabilizes, becoming moderately cool. It roughly matches the average annual surface temperature of around 10 to 15 degrees Celsius in temperate regions. Conditions deteriorate further as active life continues its slow decline. Let's descend several dozen feet deeper. 50 meters, 164 feet, is the arbitrary boundary of stable temperature. This marks the lower limit of the stable temperature zone. From here, the temperature gradually begins to rise. 68 meters, 223 feet. At this depth, we find the roots of the camel thorn tree, one of the most remarkable desert trees. In relentless droughts where life seems doomed, this tree clings on to every drop of water, extracting it from unimaginable depths with its powerful roots. It is a true symbol of resilience and defiance against death. Wait a moment, there's water here. Exactly. We've reached a zone rich in groundwater, minerals and organic matter. Could this mean that life might thrive once again in these conditions? Let's not jump to conclusions, but go a little deeper and we'll see for ourselves. 100 meters, 328 feet. Here we'll pause to take a closer look. What does our detector reveal? The conditions here are hopeless, with almost no free oxygen to be found. However, this layer is rich in water and saturated with minerals. And where there's water, there's the potential for life. But who lives here? Primarily microbes that feed on minerals and organic matter dissolve in water. These micro scavengers or heterotrophic bacteria consume organic matter that seeps down with water from decomposed plants, roots and animals. There's far less organic material here than in the upper layers, but the inhabitants are, to put it mildly, undemanding. They've adapted to survive on the barest of essentials. In such extreme conditions, only a few organisms manage to survive, and among them is the remarkable bacterium, Disulfur vibrio vulgaris, a microscopic survival hero. He doesn't even need oxygen to live. This bacterium breathes sulfur, releasing hydrogen sulfide. It thrives in diverse environments from deep geological layers in the ocean floor to hot springs and oil fields. The bacterium can use hydrogen and metals to generate energy. This tiny living thing also interacts with toxic metals including uranium, making it suitable for cleaning up radioactive contamination areas. But even more fascinating, creatures wait for us even lower. 
As we delve deeper, pressure increases and life becomes increasingly rare. We finally reach the bedrock, the threshold to a completely different underground world. It's a distinct universe within our planet, governed by impenetrable darkness and unforgiving laws that are more extreme than anything found on the surface. We've reached a depth of 500 meters, that's 1,640 feet. Here the temperature is 10 to 15 degrees Celsius higher than the average surface temperature in the same area. But the pressure, it reaches 90 atmospheres, which is more than on the surface of Venus. Imagine placing your refrigerator on your palm and then stacking eight more on top of it. At this depth, we encounter extremophiles. These organisms earned their names because they thrive in conditions we would find unbearable. High temperatures, immense pressure and complete darkness. But for them, this environment is home. Occasionally, even multicellular creatures can be found here, such as microscopic nematode worms feeding on bacteria. But what seems like hell here is merely a prelude to great horrors. We now descend twice as deep. Here, the temperature rises further and oxygen almost completely disappears. Are you ready to discover who can survive this hot airless darkness? We continue drilling our exploratory borehole and pass the 1,000 meter, that's 3,281 foot mark. Deeper than the height of the Burj Khalifa, but underground. Down here, it's already quite warm, around 30 degrees Celsius, and there's almost no free oxygen. We enter a zone where the temperature begins to rise significantly and oxygen is virtually absent. Here we encounter professional survivalists, Thermo Dessel for Vibrio. What makes them special is the ability to adapt to even higher temperatures. These microorganisms extract energy from sulfur compounds. They appear as rod-shaped or slightly curved cells about 20,000 times smaller than an average ant. Despite their size, they're surprisingly agile. They have a flagellum that functions as a motor, propelling them through their environment. Shall we go even deeper? After all, one kilometer underground is just a shallow scratch. The true extremes await at depths of several thousand meters, where molten rock and crushing pressure test the limits of life. We finally reach a depth of four kilometers, 2.4 miles unimaginable masses of earth, sand and colossal rocks lie above us. The pressure here rivals that of the Mariana Trench exceeding 1000 atmospheres. The temperature has climbed to around 120 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, water on the surface would already have boiled away and turned into gas. But here, monstrous pressure keeps it liquid. The heat at this depth is an echo of Earth's ancient history. It has been preserved since the planet's formation and is further fueled by the radioactive decay of elements such as uranium and thorium. At this depth, their radiation creates a lethal radioactive environment. Radiation, heat, zero oxygen. If hell exists, it must look something like this. Can life forms possibly survive here? Actually, they can. If we look closer, we'll see that solid rock isn't entirely solid. It's penetrated by cracks, voids, and tiny pores. Sandstone or limestone is so porous that up to 40% of its volume is made up of voids. Even denser rocks like granite or basalt are often veined with microfractures. For microorganisms, these cracks are hardly micro. They're vast caves and tunnels, often filled with water. Isn't that a paradise? Just as the atmosphere is constantly churning, creating what we call weather, something similar occurs with these rocks. Yes, the Earth's crust is in constant motion, creating what could be called rock weather, and it occurs on all scales. Continents collide, and countless strong and weak earthquakes open new fissures and passages, creating fresh spaces for life while closing others forever. This colossal, powerful process is also unimaginably slow. When continents collide or drift apart, the energy released is equivalent to the impact of dozens of asteroid strikes, like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. But this process occurs three times slower than your hair grows. In this hot, ever-moving cauldron, minerals are forged and organic molecules are both created and destroyed. We've reached a frontier where life doesn't just survive, it challenges the very nature of existence. Here, some organisms perform feats that append our understanding of what it means to live. Let's start by saying that while life does exist at these depths, it's extreme in every sense of the word. 
so much so that it's hard to believe at times. So at this depth, we can find a bacteria known as Desulfuridis or Daxviata. It was discovered in water samples from South African gold mines at a depth of 2.7 kilometers, that's 1.6 miles. In the conditions where it was found, Desulfuridis or Daxviata is the only known organism. Its survival depends solely on chemical energy with no sunlight or organic carbon. Its metabolism is incredibly, incredibly slow. These creatures test the limits of life. You might have heard a joke that since microbes live for mere seconds, there's no point in washing your hands. Well, that wouldn't work with Desulfuridis or Daxviata. Studies show that this bacterium divides only once every 100 to even 1,000 years. When vital resources like hydrogen, sulfate and carbon are scarce, this amazing bacterium enters a dormant state. It slows all processes to the bare minimum, teetering on the edge of life and death, waiting for a better conditions. Instead of reproducing actively, it focuses on preserving a tiny spark of life. Nature has endowed it with the ability to survive almost anything. A bacterium that lives for a thousand years sounds to say the least very unusual. But the secret to its longevity lies in an unbelievably slow metabolism. Imagine that this bacterium ate something on the day you were born. Well, chances are it's still digesting its breakfast. So here's how it works if you want to live for a thousand years. Live slowly. But these bacteria have yet another astonishing ability. At such depths, when conditions become too extreme or food runs out, the bacterium destroys itself. No, not out of despair, but to survive. How can that be? Let us explain. Sensing that even harsher conditions are coming, the bacterium divides into a larger and a smaller part. Then it reabsorbs the smaller part, forming a cell within a cell. Next, the outer cell completely rids itself of water, effectively destroying itself and leaving behind a spore containing only genetic material. The spore can then drift for thousands of years until it finds a suitable environment for life, or simply wait for conditions to improve on their own. Who else could potentially survive at such depths? Take, for example, Altiaceum hamiconoxum, a type of archaea with a rare double membrane coated in specific substances that protect them from extreme conditions. These tiny organisms possess a unique ability. They grow thin protein filaments covered in miniature hooks. These nano hooks allow them to latch onto virtually anything from solid minerals to other microbes. Once anchored, the archaea settle into a slow, deliberate rhythm of life. They quietly reside in cracks and voids completely devoid of oxygen, surviving on carbon dioxide and trace amounts of other substances. In general, conditions within the Earth are so harsh that microbes form clusters to survive. They form biofilm, a thin, sticky protective layer that shields them from the hostile environment. The individual cells within these communities are incredibly small and of minimal genomes. This is because they are highly specialized. Almost every species in the group specializes in one particular function. For instance, one type of microbe consumes methane and releases electrons. Another type absorbs electrons and uses them to transform sulfate into sulfite, which is then consumed by a third type of microbe and so on. This is just a small glimpse of what we know about underground life. The Earth's depths still conceal many secrets along with clues about where else in the universe life might exist. What if right now, similar organisms are hiding beneath the surfaces of other planets, waiting for their moment 